and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we would look at the auditor's professional liability, specifically under common law. This topic is covered in auditing and attestation course, as well as on the CPA exam. If you need additional lectures about this topic, as well as auditing topic, please go to my website, farhatlectures.com, where I have additional topics. Now, in the prior session, we looked at contract law and what is the auditor's responsibility under contract contract law. In this session, we would look at common law. And in the following session, we would look at the federal statute, spe specifically 1933-1934. So the first thing we want to know is what is common law? Because it's very important that you understand the idea of common law. Common law is a law that passed by a court and it's upheld by the court. So it's shaped by court precedents. What is a precedent? It's basically a prior court decision. And to be more specific, each court and a state system is separate from the other court in the other state system. So in the United States, we have many states. So each state will have its own court system. And whatever that court decide the law to be, the law will be in that state as the court decided. And that will be that law until a new judge or a new jury decides that the law need to be changed. So it's prior court decision. So simply put, if a judge, if, if a case land in front of a judge, the judge would look at how did the prior judge ruled given the circumstances and the, the current judge if they agree with the prior judge then the law will stand as what the prior judge decided it to be but if the new if the new judge decided or the new jury decided that how the law was applied pr pr prior to this case is not valid then the law becomes the new judgment of that court okay so it's obviously the common law is subject to change over time as a result of a judge's and jury's decision. And it evolves over time. At the end of this session, I will show you a quick case of how it evolves. But basically, the idea is it evolves. Why? Because it's a judge-based. It's a court-based. One single judge and a state can change the law. Okay, that's how it works. So there could be significant differences in common law across different ju jurisdictions. Each state has its own court system. Therefore, we could have different laws among different states. The reason why we're talking about, you're, you're going to see why common law is, it's, it's important to understand what common law is, because depending where the suit is filed against the auditor, the law will differ. So the precedent could be different. So if they file in Pennsylvania versus New Jersey, Pennsylvania law is different than New Jersey law. So that's why it, it depends on where the suit is filed. And we, we 50 different states, we could have 50 different different jurisdiction with 50 different laws. Think about marijuana. For example, marijuana is legal in Colorado. It's not legal in any other state. Why? Because the state decide it's legal there. Therefore, the, the, the court decides it's legal there. Therefore, it's legal in that state until a new judge comes and said, no, it's not legal. Then it's not legal anymore. Okay. But as far as auditors liability are concerned, we're going to look at three different precedents. So again, we have many jurisdictions, but Basically, all these jurisdictions, all these state courts, they follow three different precedents. They're not the same. They're three different precedents and how they look, how they approach auditor's liability. And that's why we're talking about common law, because we're concerned about auditor's liability. We're not legal students. And hopefully you learn about common law when you took your business law course or when you're taking your business law course. But for my purpose, you are only concerned with the three different precedents that I will discuss later on. OK, so who the plaintiff is? And the degree of auditor misconduct, it's gonna it's gonna depend on the jurisdiction. So, in one jurisdiction, you might be able to uh, to sue the auditor for negligence. In other jurisdiction, you may not be able to sue the auditor for negligence. It depending who you are and the degree of auditor misconduct. And we'll talk about little bit more, much more details in this session. But the point is, common law is different among different jurisdictions. So, what's a civil liability requirement in one state could be another in another state. Okay, but let's talk about what the plaintiff, because remember, the plaintiff is, go is going to sue the auditor. The plaintiff will sue the auditor. Why? Because of the auditor misconduct. The auditor may be issued an unqualified financial statement and missed something. So the plaintiff must show four things to succeed under common law. And what are those four things? First, the audit, the plaintiff will have to show that the financial statements were materially misstated. And that's not hard to prove if the if the auditor issue a, a unqualified opinion, then they went back and they revised earnings per share or they find a mistake. Well, th the statements were materially misstated. So that's easy to prove as far as the plaintiff is concerned, because once we found the mistake, well, the prior financial statements were materially misstated. That's the first thing they have to show. The second thing is damages, the existing amount of damages. So how much 
did they lose? What are the damages? That's easy also to prove, especially if it's a publicly traded company. If you bought a stock for a $100 and after the restatement, the stock dropped to $70, well, guess what? There was a $30 decrease in the stock times, you know, you have 10,000 stocks or well, whatever, how many stocks you have. So that's also easy to show. The third, you have to show causality. You have to show that the damages result from relying on the statement. So simply put, when the auditor said EPS was $2, you bought the stock. Then we find out that the now EPS should be $1.20. So earnings per share went down. As a result, the stock price went down. As a result, you lost that $30 per stock. But you have to show the damages are coming from the actual fault of the auditor. Okay, so you have to show that the auditor caused the damage. Now, how can you link? How can you link because of the auditor, the auditor's mistake, you suffer the damages. It's a little bit more difficult than the other two, but it's 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 doable based on the market efficiency market efficiency theory. Assuming you are dealing with a publicly traded company, for a publicly traded company, the assumption is the stock price reflect information about the company. So all the information about the stock, which is earnings per share, when you issue the financial statement, is embedded. So when I bought the stock, I assumed that I have I bought a stock with two dollars earnings per share. Now you're telling me otherwise. Why you're telling me otherwise? Because you made a mistake. And because you made a mistake, you're telling me otherwise. EPS went down. My stock price, my stock price went down. And here's the causality because the stock price is reflecting the new information. It's embedded in the stock price. Okay. And you don't have to look at the financial statement. Uh, to, you don't have to show that. Well, I look at the financial statements. EPS was two dollars when I bought it. You don't have to show this. As long as you say I relied on the market. The market is, is supposed to determine the stock price. When I bought the stock price at one hundred dollar, that was the market price, and that market price reflected all information, which is part of it, the $2 earnings per share that it was misstated. So those three, you still have one more. And the fourth one is you have to show the auditor misconduct. That's important. What type of misconduct? And that depends on who you are as a plaintiff and the jurisdiction in which you filed the lawsuit. And this is where we have to kind of differentiate between who you are as a plaintiff and which jurisdiction you are going to show that the plaintiff messed up so the, the so uh, i'm sorry the defendant the you have to show that the auditor messed up and how at what level was it negligence gross negligence and who you are and in which jurisdiction so simply put what's going to happen is this so who can file simply put who can file obviously the client can always file and under common law, third party reasonably expected to rely on the audited financial statements. So notice, third party reasonably expected is way more than the contract law. Remember, the contract law, you have to be part of the engagement letter mentioned in the, enga mentioned in the engagement letter. Okay. Here, if you are reasonably expected to rely on the audited financial statements, then you, you, you are potentially, you potentially can sue the auditor for misconduct. But who are those third party reasonably reasonably expected well the common law breaks them into three groups so you could have three groups of third party who are reasonably expected that could rely on the audited financial statement the first group is called identified users and you need to differentiate between those groups for the cpa exam okay so who are the unidentified users well the identified user let's assume a client came to you as the auditor and they told you i'm going to go to the bank of philadelphia i want to get a loan i want you to audit my financial statements Guess what? The client obviously is the client. Then the bank of the first bank of Philadelphia becomes an identified user. Why? Because you told me, you mentioned that, that you're going to go get a loan after issuing those financial statements. So users that the auditor know would rely on the financial statement. For example, the first bank of Philadelphia, you, you told me. And it doesn't have to be written orally. Orally is good enough. Okay. Or you could say maybe two banks and the, I mean, just you could name two, three banks. Okay. Those are identified users. In other words, you identify them. You told me who they are. Now I know they are going to be using the financial statement. Another group called foreseen users. Okay, those foreseen users, they're not ident individually known. So you did not specifically mention their name, that they're going to be relying on the financial statements. But you said it's a group of people. For example, you could say, I'm going to, after you audit the financial statements, I'm going to take them to the five banks in the Philadelphia area. Who are those five banks? Well, well, basically, any bank in the Philadelphia area, in, in a sense, becomes a foreseen user, okay? And those are still small number, 
okay but larger than identified because identified they have to name them specifically orally or in writing for scene users you did not name which five banks but now you have more banks or you could say banks in the philadelphia area potentially every bank in the philadelphia area becomes a foreseen user okay and the third group is for for foreseeable users and this is where this group is very large the foreseeable users is a general class of users whose members may or may not rely on the financial statements okay this is a large group once again, what are we discussing here? We're discussing who can sue the auditor. Well, the client obviously can sue the auditor and third party reasonably expected to rely on the financial statements. Those third parties, they can be identified users, foreseen users and foreseeable users. Why am I specifying this? Because you're going to see on the next slide, depending who you are in the lawsuit would allow you to sue the auditor under various under various claims okay so let's take a look at this uh, at this slide okay and remember the users are you could we could have three type of users we have the identified users and remember those are specifically identified we have the foreseen users and we have the foreseeable users we have three users so now, who, who are you, depending on who you are, identified, foreseen, or foreseeable? Then when you go to, when you go to sue the auditor, well, you're going to go to your state court to sue the auditor. Now, depending on your, on your jurisdiction, we have three types of jurisdiction. Credit alliance, restatement, torch, rush factor, which is those are two cases. Basically, but two cases, but basically they came up with the same decision. That's why there's a two name and Citizen Bank, Rosenblum, or, you know, Tim Schmidt case. Tim with two M's, okay? So those are the three different jurisdictions. So all the state courts in the United States, when you go to sue the, when you go to sue the auditor, they're going to follow one of these three cases, okay? So let's start with identified user, okay? If you are an identified user, what can you do? Well, if you're filing under a credit alliance jurisdiction, you could sue for negligence. So as long as you are identified user, you you could sue for negligence. As long as you can show that the that that the auditor was careless, you can you can sue them. Under restatement tort rush factor, you could also sue for negligence. Under the citizen state Rosenblum, you could sue for negligence. So as identified user, you're you're very close. You are very close to the case because you are identified in the contract. You have the right to sue the auditor for negligence. Now, if you are a foreseen user you are a foreseen user and you happen to file the file the case in a credit alliance state so i'm going to tell you this to make it easier for you for example in pennsylvania pa uses the credit alliance as well as new york new york and pa use the they follow the credit alliance precedent okay remember common law it's precedent they filed this precedent so if you're a foreseen user and you file a case in that state under the credit alliance if you're a foreseen user you can you have you have you can you can sue for gross negligence so a foreseen user cannot sue for negligence a foreseen user they have to sue for gross negligence and remember gross negligence you have to show that they were really careless so your standard of proof is a little bit higher okay if you are a foreseen user and in a place where it's they use restatement or rush factor even a foreseen user can sue for negligence also if you are in a state where they follow the citizen bank Rosenblum case, like in New Jersey, in New Jersey follow this, they, they, you can sue, even though you're a foreseen user, you can sue for negligence. Again, it's easier to sue when you can sue for negligence. It's easier to prove negligence. If you're a foreseeable user, now you're far away from the case. You're a foreseeable future, a foreseeable user. You're a shareholder, creditor. Under credit alliance, you could sue for gross negligence. Under Restatement tort, you could also sue the auditor for ne gross negligence, not negligence, gross negligence. But notice, under the Citizen Bank Rosenblum case, you can sue for negligence. So even though you're a foreseeable user in New Jersey or in any state that followed the Citizen Bank Rosenblum precedent, you can sue the auditor for negligence. It means the lower of proof is much lower for you if you sue the auditor in those states. So notice, um, courts that follow the Citizen Bank Rosenblum, 
they allow you to sue the auditor, whatever your position is, for negligence, whether you're identified user, foreseen user, or foreseeable user. So notice here, Credit Alliance is the most the friendliest to the auditor because only as an identified user you could sue for negligence. For foreseen and foreseeable, you have to have you have to you can only sue under gross negligence case. Okay? Why am I talking about this? Because look. And under Credit Alliance, the negligence is a small group of individuals, a small group of people who are identified users. They are either mentioned uh, orally or mentioned and written in the contract. Versus foreseeable users, they could be a bunch, a lot of, for a publicly traded company, basically everyone can sue the company in New Jersey, sue the, the auditor in New Jersey because they are foreseeable user, also for negligence. So the lower of proof is much, much smaller okay so this this belong this is a large group of people it could be hundreds of thousands okay for uh, uh for publicly traded company and all what you need is one person in new jersey okay that filed a lawsuit and everybody else can jump on the board in a class action lawsuit with them okay so let's talk a little bit about since we talked about common law let's talk about a little bit how that common law evolved over the years just to give you an idea how it evolved so so this identified foreseen and foreseeable started with a case called Fred Stern and Company case. I believe it's in the 20s. You can Google it, but it's, it started in the 20s. Basically, prior to the Fred Stern and Company case, if you are a foreseen or foreseeable user, okay, you could only sue under fraud. And remember, fraud is very hard to prove fraud. Why? Because you have to show intent, and it's not, not easy to show intent that the auditor committed fraud. Okay, remember we talked about negligence, gross negligence, and fraud. So prior to this case, as a foreseen or foreseeable user, you could only sue under fraud. So here's the company called Fred Stern and Company. They borrowed money from a bank called Ultramaris, Ultramaris Bank. The case is called Ultramaris, okay? That's what it's called, Ultramaris case or the Fred Stern and Company case. And Fred Stern hired Touche Nevine to audit their financial statement. And specifically, they audited their balance sheet, but they missed something on the balance sheet, and the balance sheet was inflated by $700,000. So they went to the bank, the auditor missed the mistake, and the bank gave them the loan. Now, obviously, Ultramaris went out of business. I'm not, not Ultramaris, Fred Stern went out of business. So Ultramaris, the bank, they wanted to recover their money because they lent money to, to, to Fred Stern. So they went after the auditor, okay? now. Ultramaris was not named in the engagement letter, so it was not named at that point. So the only option for Ultramaris at that point is to sue the auditor for fraud, because that's the only thing that was available. You want to sue the auditor, you're not named to, to the as part of the engagement letter, you can sue them for fraud. Well, guess what? The case was dismissed for fraud. But what the jury find, determined is that the auditor was negligent, and Ultramaris should be able to recover under losses. Now, obviously, now the, the law is changing. So what did Touche did? They appealed it. They appealed the case. Said no. Well, obviously they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna just pay out. They're gonna appeal the case. Okay. So after various appeals, the case landed. The case landed with Judge Cordoza in the New York Court of Appeal, which is the highest court in the state of New York. And based and by the way, Judge Cordoza became a Supreme Court later on. But the point is, now it's in the hands of the highest court in the state. So what did Judge Cordoza determine, okay? What he said is, third parties specifically mentioned in the engagement letter, the primary beneficiary, now they can sue for negligence, okay? But also, third parties should be able to recover from gross negligence. So what they did, it, before it used to be only fraud. So before the Ultramaris case, before the, Judge Cordoza decided on this case, basically Judge Cordoza opened the door and lower the standard of proof for the uh, 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 for the users, okay? And he said, now we, we have identified users, foreseen and foreseeable. And what, he, what he's saying is third party now, they could sue the auditor under gross negligence. And basically this is an example of how common law evolves, okay? So simply put, now the auditor after this case start to face increased legal exposure because a third party, a foreseen, can even sue you for gross negligence and anyone mentioned in the engagement letter what's called old prim primary beneficiary, which is even mentioned, that's a primary beneficiary, can also sue you, sue you for negligence. Because those parties, prior to the Ultramaris case, they could only sue you for fraud, and fraud has a high standard. So hopefully this case just gave you an idea about common law, how common law works, because it's it's a little bit, uh, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's, 
it's not complicated, but it's 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 not straightforward. Um, if you're studying for your CPA exam, by all means, study hard. If you want more lectures about auditing, please go to my website, forhatlectures.com. If you do visit, please consider donating uh, or contributing money. And if you're studying for your CPA, study hard. It's worth it.